This video was brought to you by a suggestion from the user Fight for Power, who also provided some information on the earliest prototype of relics. Additionally, viewer discretion is advised due to violent and disturbing content on the earlier relics titles, as well as a great deal of flashing lights. Sometimes games are created where their ambition far exceeds the limits of the hardware that they're straining to fit into, coming up with ideas years ahead of their time. With designs and concepts with an eye turned toward the surreal, and in mid-1980s Japan, one game series in particular would exemplify this sort of trend, almost feeling like an art game at times. Designed by a young team crammed into the second floor of a former cafe in Aoyama, as well as getting a little help from a popular rock band that the team happened to know, and taking inspiration from all sorts of artwork and media, ranging from the paintings of H.R. Giger to films like Angel's Egg and the Castle of Cagliostro. Game company Bothtech would make a striking and unusual title, with ideas in it that wouldn't become commonplace in gaming until decades later. With a deliberately obtuse presentation, a confused and intrigued press, and an unusual marketing campaign, the game would leave such an impression that multiple sequels and reboots would come out in the same universe. Unfortunately, though, technical limitations and ongoing troubles on the business side of things would mar these sequels. And another company finishing development on the final title due to these conflicts would cause the series to have a bit of an identity crisis in its final entry. This is the story of Relics. It's 1985 and game company Bothtech has moved to the second floor of a former cafe in Aoyama. Bothtech had started their company with a somewhat unusual idea similar to the early days of Enix. Their first games were actually winners of design contests held by the company, with the prize being that the game creator would be able to work at the company, as well as receive some prize money from a 3 million yen pool. Fresh from the sales of their contest winners, games like Eggy and Yokai Detective Chimachima, they would also end up acquiring considerable talent, and one of the developers that won that prize was young programmer Rei Nakazato, with his game Chobin. And at this new environment in Aoyama, he and other young members would start work on developing Bothtech's first full in-house title, Relics, initially an attempt at a side-scrolling action game. But Nakazato's first version, as shown here by former Bothtech member and eventual Wolf Team member, Katsuya Hirata, would change drastically, as Nakazato and other staff, including Yoshihiko Takei, whose ideas would influence this change in direction, decided to go with something much more ambitious in scope. Joined by producer and head of Bothtech Ryuichi Yamaki, the team had a much grander idea in mind than something simple and action -y. They wanted something with more of a sandbox feel. They also wanted something a bit more mysterious and cerebral. The team wanted the player to think about who they were through the lens of the game that they were experiencing, and reflect on their actions during gameplay. In the interest of doing all of this, they would come up with an unusual design approach that feels much more modern than something from 1985. In order to put the player in this unusual mindset, they were to be given only limited information, with a manual of relics being very sparse, only going over the most basic of gameplay functions and reiterating that the player had to look to themselves to figure out the game. Due to these restrictions, the player would have to learn from experimentation and repeated deaths in order to understand gameplay and story. This story would also be deliberately vague and frightening, and to further player discomfort, the controls would be unusual, forcing the player to feel like they were not totally in control of the character. Most importantly, instead of a key character for the player to identify with, the game would have a possession mechanic called Spirit Ride 
with the player as a disembodied phantom, taking control of corpses and animals. To create such an unusual game, Bothtech would implement the designs of artist Kazuyuki Takamoto, who would take a lot of inspiration himself from H.R. Giger in creating an alien and inhospitable world. For the music for the intro, there would be an unusual and lucky break, as members of the team were acquainted with members of the rock band Crystal King, arguably most famous to Westerners for their opening song for the anime adaptation of the Fist of the North Star franchise. One of the first instances of a licensed song would appear here, with Crystal King's song Woman playing over the opening credits. Relics itself wears its inspiration on its sleeve as the game begins, showing a mechanical city rising out of the ocean to horrible noises, a possible homage to the opening of the film Angel's Egg, and a deliberate homage to the climax of the film The Castle of Cagliostro duplicating the unpleasant mechanical and oral horrors of that first film's opening minutes, and the ancient architecture of the Lupin film's climax. A small introduction tells a vague story of two forces at eternal war, and makes a point that good and evil aren't clearly defined. As woman plays, and the credits roll in, the atmosphere is intense, but this is the last the player will hear of music in the game until the very end and that's only if the player can determine the correct actions to reach the appropriate ending. The overwhelming feeling upon booting up relics is one of oppression. We possess a rabbit, then a soldier, but there's nothing friendly here, even among the soldier's compatriots. Orders are screamed at you. Small robots float in the air and shock you, knocking you backwards. Vaguely organic, twisted feminine forms exist as item chests that fire poison at you. And as the player explores, it gets worse, with creepy messages from soldiers and vaguely mythological figures eventually pushing the player towards the lower levels of this environment. A place called Hell, filled with powerful monsters and grotesque imagery, as the walls themselves pulse like a heartbeat the closest thing this game has to in-game music, amplifying the frightening mood. The violence in this game is brutal, with the non-monstrous people and creatures you encounter crawling away from you when hurt, immediately questioning the actions of the player. As a matter of fact, going back to the ideas that Bothtech had of the player being reflective during gameplay, the actions that the protagonist takes are tracked. And needless killing will set off flags and affect the ability to see the true ending of the game. Act too aggressively, and you'll lock yourself out of the optimal route of completion by your own cruelty. With no save points to speak of, and the aforementioned limited controls, you have to turn up to turn left or right, and combat is deliberately restrictive, clunky, and messy. Experimentation is the name of the game here for making any meaningful progress. Jumping into different bodies gives you different abilities, and sometimes also the ability to understand other characters. There is a surprising amount of English text in the game though unfortunately none for the opening and ending, save for the beginning of one version we'll talk about later on. From these small bits of dialogue, as well as a substitution cipher that the player can figure out outside of the game, the player is slowly able to piece together three possible endings, just escaping from wherever this place is, defeating one of the strongest monsters in the area, or finding the actual true path to completion which involves finding their original body, rescuing a captured woman, and leading her back to the start of the game. Upon achieving the true ending of Relics, a text scroll reveals some of the additional background of the game, that in an eternal struggle of forces called Heaven and Hell, there were once five heroes that set out to destroy Hell's Emperor. But they did not succeed and eventually in the struggle between these two forces, the Earth was wrecked. 
However, since the battle is eternal, a plan was made for one of the heroes to resurrect. This is what was happening in the story. The hero was regaining their original body, and also rescuing a woman involved in the conflict. The vague story reveals one final wrinkle as a surprise, that the game itself was a message across time and space, and that when the player bought relics, they woke up the character and the world that he was in. In other words, the player was possessing the character in the game, just as the character was possessing others, and that's why the game was judging you based on a karma system. The resurrection wasn't so much the revival of a former soldier. You, the player, were piloting him the entire time. There's a lot of meta narrative to unpack here, and the manual of Relics makes a point that they want the player to fill in the blanks on this deliberately vague story. But the interesting thing about the story Relics is telling is that it's very much a world in an RPG fail state. The legendary heroes are dead or captured. The world has transformed into a biomechanical horror. And the fight has gone on so long that the war has lost all meaning. A final line of text in the credit scroll vows for the player to defeat the Emperor of Hell. But if we look at the gameplay and the dialogue within the game itself, we've already encountered something like that. And it's dead, with the player character making similar remarks about the Emperor being dead upon joining his own body. So this reinforces the ambiguity. Is the player really contributing, or are they just sucked into this endless, meaningless war? These ideas of environmental storytelling, karma meters, obscure doling out of information, and fourth wall breaks had a scope that would be unusual for a modern game. And as one can imagine, it took a while for relics to be interpreted by contemporary press. Magazine coverage initially contained a lot of conjecture on how the game worked, musing on what data was exactly tracked by the game to determine endings. And there was a lot of discussion and interviews with the creators on the mood of the game as a horror piece, as well as their intentions for the game. The marketing, too, was unusual, and perhaps a bit misguided. While the marketing in print, for the most part, emphasized the horror and Giger aspects, also showing off some pretty incredible box art. And sometimes mixed in the quotes about the philosophical nature of the game, with some unusual descriptions like a suspenseful synchro mind story. The live events for Relics did not, with one of the most baffling being a family event for Relics that was held in November 1986 called Relics Fair, and covered in Login Magazine. Because there's nothing more exciting for children and families than a game about dead soldiers contemplating the horrifying and cyclical nature of a doomed universe in a war between uncaring gods. Bothtech even had someone in costume to pose with fans and kids for this, and also gave out free merch. Enjoy your existential despair at the eldritch horrors of the universe, kids. The tote bags are complimentary. Relics would do very well, selling over a hundred thousand copies according to Rei Nakazato. And it would get a large number of ports, with each of them having their own quirks. The 8-bit versions, though, suffer a pretty heavy graphical downgrade, and the MSX2 version loses the animations in the intro, although the MSX port has an English introduction. The MSX port would do well enough that it would even make it over to Europe, published by Eaglesoft. Depending on how you look at it, given the vagueness of the first game, the story would continue or be remixed in Relics and Koku Yusai, otherwise known as Relics the Dark Fortress, for the Famicom Disk System. This idea of a remix that could also be reasonably interpreted as a sequel will be a narrative trick that the games would employ from here on out, complementing the ambiguity of the first game. Relics and Koku Yusai reveals the fate of the five legendary warriors mentioned in the epilogue of the original. They have been doomed to wander a biomechanical labyrinth for eternity, and once again it's up to a soul-hopping entity to rescue a woman involved in the conflict, defeat a powerful monster, and set things right. 
Relics the Dark Fortress is a much more straightforward game than the PC-98 original, taking a lot of inspiration from Metroid. Sadly, though, the limitations of the Famicom Disk System would severely hamper this title and make it borderline unplayable. Due to the limitations of the system, the game has to load information a lot. And by a lot, I mean on every screen. Start the game, flip the disc over and wait through a load time. Go up a ladder, wait through a load time. Fall down a hole, wait through a load time. Enemy needs to appear on screen, wait through a load time. Enter a dungeon, flip the disc, sometimes multiple times, and wait through a load time. It is excruciating. And with each of these load times lasting between 5 to 10 seconds each time, it hurts the game tremendously. And that's kind of a shame here as some of the ideas are interesting and carry you on with the darker themes of the original game. The player character's possession mechanic has been nerfed a bit, and they can only possess the bodies of the former warriors, who are bosses here, asking you to kill them so that you can take them over. You're constantly punching walls to get items and upgrades, showing even more biomechanical mass behind the stone facade and the game still has a very lonely and confusing feel. Unfortunately, though, those constant loading times and wonky controls work against this game, and would really wreck it in the press, with many contemporary reviewers such as Famitsu knocking off tremendous points for the load times and general technical failures of the game. This negative reception would bury the Relics franchise for a while. Thankfully, though, modern players can get a version from Project Egg which speeds up the load times massively and erases the disc flipping, making the game much more playable and enjoyable, if still frustratingly difficult. This is the version to get if you want to check the game out. While still highly difficult, the game is now much less annoying to play. There is one advantage to tracking down the FDS version over this superior version, though. The Famicom Disk System version now has an English fan translation. After their bad luck with the Famicom Disk System version of Relics, Both Tech would go back to making PC titles, and they would achieve a great deal of success with games based on the Legend of Galactic Heroes franchise, as well as publish and port some cult classics such as The Scheme. They'd also end up merging with Quest, the makers of Ogre Battle, although that would split up again in 1997, but not before some hires would transfer over from Quest to Bothtech. But towards the end of the 1990s, Ryoichi Yamaki would try to correct some of the mistakes of Dark Fortress and bring back some of this series' mysterious nature. And Ryoichi Yamaki would achieve this by working with former Quest member and artist Ryoichi Nakamura who would act as director on a new title that would take inspiration from some surprising sources. Released in 1997, Hack and Slash Blizzard classic Diablo had ended up doing surprisingly well in Japan's lagging PC market. And once again, the ideas of trying to go beyond a popular genre began to percolate at Bothtech. Instead of a simple Hack and Slash, inspiration would also be taken from CRPGs, the obtuse lore of the Relics games would be expanded on and clarified a bit. The idea of good and evil playthroughs would be iterated on. And the freedom of the player would be expanded greatly with faction mechanics and an extremely large amount of player choice. Released in 1999, Relics the Recur of Origin manages to bring the series back on track quite a bit. Somewhere between a retelling and a reboot, it tells the story of a lost soul landing on a distant planet with no memory of its former life. And it's gradually pieced together through dialogue that the protagonist is in a ruin in which the remnants of a battle between two long-dead races called the forces of heaven and hell have occurred. Although those forces are not quite as dead as they initially appear to be. The red-suited faction of the original game has been given a new title, Marks, 
a third group investigating the ruins in both races. And there are also additional unexplained horrors that make up another faction, as well as various animals and aliens. Relics the Recur of Origins New Retooling as an isometric RPG gives a tremendous amount of freedom to the player. The level of violence the player commits, who they possess through the spirit ride mechanic, making a welcome, less restrictive return this time around, and what factions they ally with can unlock a multitude of endings, around 30 in total, giving the player an absurd amount of freedom in tackling the story. These endings can range from something similar to the original relics, recovering the protagonist's own body and rescuing a young woman involved in the Heaven and Hell conflict, to siding with various forces in the ruin, to even more unusual endings, genociding every living thing on the planet, or becoming a type of rabbit. These endings, accompanied by some beautiful illustrations, unlock when completed for future viewing. And the game has a bit of a cult following, with multiple fan translations attempted, although none have been completed as of yet. While the level of freedom is commendable, I do think that Relics the Recur of Origin loses some of the violently oppressive and desperate atmosphere that the first game had. While the story definitely still feels bleak, the reveals make the characters feel less like archetypes, and that takes away some of the power of the player's interpretation. The protagonist himself, once his identity is uncovered, no longer feels like a player avatar. He is simply Nastarkal, a fallen soldier with a deep history with multiple factions in the game. And as you move toward what is considered one of the only happy endings in the game, just escaping from everyone with the woman involved in the conflict, these changes make Recur of Origin feel a little more conventional. You're no longer playing in an RPG fail state, now you're just in an RPG. These changes would cause Recur of Origin to gain a cult following, and it did pretty well, with an active message board in Bothtech's website, exchanging strategies and theories, and some fond memories popping up on message boards even to this day. But at that time, the series was now free of the stigma of how bad Ankoko Yusai was, and it was time to move forward in the universe and enter a development on a sequel. For this sequel, the Relic series will continue to narrow their focus into something less freeform. And the result of that would be Relic's The Second Birth. This is actually a direct sequel to Recur of Origin. And for the first time, we are not the avatar of a spirit or nameless being. Instead, we have two primary characters, Randy and Karen, members of forces within Marx. Randy is actually named after a Henshin Tigers baseball player. And the game has party mechanics as well as some multiplayer gameplay features over the internet that have long since died. While well, this remains a dark story, Randy, a soldier within Marks, will eventually be forced out of his own body and reborn as a hell creature depending on his actions, the so-called second birth of the title. This time around, the game once again feels a little softer. People are actively researching the factions within the game. There's plenty of people to talk to that aren't openly hostile, even when you're a creature. And the fourth wall breaking, so effectively creepy in the first Relics game, is gone now. This is very much Randy's story, and the 30 endings have now been reduced to only two. There are some gameplay modifications as well, with the Spirit Ride system now more used for stealing abilities and story beats, than actual body swapping, and a hub system for dungeons. Even though there were these moves towards conventional RPG, the game still being a direct sequel and involving characters from the previous game in a different light, including the first game's protagonist, Nostracol, feels like a narrative trick that's straight out of a Yoko Taro game and manages to have that ahead of its time field that the first Relics game had and the second game lacked. Despite the game having a much softer edge to it than its predecessors, it's still got quite a bit of darkness to it, and a kind of late 90s feel that makes it intriguing. 
Well, a step down a bit from Recurve Origin. It's still pretty good, and definitely worth checking out. Sadly, though, at this point in time, the cash cow that was powering Bothtech, their licensed games from the Legend of Galactic Heroes series, would run into trouble. As documented by Game Watch Japan and Retronicence, Bothtech had been producing games in this series for years. But when it came time for Legend of Galactic Heroes 7, Bothtech did not bother to renew the license before publishing the game. And that wasn't the only mistake that was made here. One particular sticking point on the original license was international licensing. And since Legend of Galactic Heroes 7 had MMORPG elements that required rollouts and servers in other countries, that caused even more conflict, and copyright holder and representative of the Legend of Galactic Heroes author, Raito Staff Limited, was not okay with this, and it would end up in court. As documented by multiple sources, in 2004, Legend of Galactic Heroes author Yoshiki Tanaka and his representing company Raito Staff would enter into litigation against Bothtech, and it would cause the shutdown of servers for Legend of Galactic Heroes 7 completely decimate Bothtech and also cease development on a planned Relic sequel for Xbox called Relics the Absolute Spirit, which Bothtech had been trying to get a worldwide release on. With Bothtech in shambles from the suit, they would actually turn to an old friend with their incomplete Relic sequel ideas. That old friend was Nihon Falcom. Falcom and Bothtech had already had a bit of a recent shared history, as Bothtech would actually port some old Falcom games to cell phones under their mobile division, formed in the early 2000s. Bothtech, in its final stages, would partner with them to make something out of the wreckage that was occurring to them at this point. In an interview promoting Guruman, Nihon Falcom head Toshihiro Kondo explained a little bit further. I wasn't directly involved with this, but that game was a joint effort. We knew each other because we were both PC game makers, and that's how the project started. We put a Falcom character in the game, and that made it a cooperative title. This collaboration would create a third game, Rene, and Rene is a bit of an odd beast. Well, it's been reported that all copyright from Relics was removed. Upon playing this game, that's not true at all. It's essentially a far future sequel, where Marx is the only remaining faction alive, but they're still experimenting with the memories of the war between Heaven and Hell, using a kind of virtual reality environment. This time around, the protagonist, Valkyrie, is not as clearly defined as Randy was. They're an offshoot of a cloning experiment from Hell's Emperor, although once again, they are involved with a mysterious woman with ties to the conflict. The spirit ride mechanic is named Body Snatch now, and due to Falcom's influence, there are some easter eggs and special characters. Characters from Brandish show up in the game, and even get their own ending, which actually has quite a bit more animations than some of the actual endings of the game. And the game was also occasionally sold as a pack-in with other titles, such as the underrated Xanadu Next. Rene doesn't really feel like a Relics game. The music, for one, is much more upbeat. And the way the cutscenes progress, the feel of the story, and the way the characters interact, feels much more in line with the Falcom game, despite the game having more endings than Second Birth. About seven in total, most of them bad ends. Well, Rene is by no means a soothing experience. Compared to the first game, it's become almost cozy. Although it is definitely a patch job on previous releases. Fundamentally using the excuse of a VR setting to deal with the reality of mixed assets and art styles from multiple in-development titles.
Both Tech would never fully recover from the Legend of Galactic Heroes lawsuit, and would splinter off in interesting directions. One of the former employees, Naoto Suzuki, would go on to maintain Project Egg, an emulation project that started around 2003, around the time of Second Birth development, and still continues to this day. Egg will be re-releasing the Relics Diablo likes this year, and they've already started taking pre-orders for that. The remains of Bothtech would be bought by Beagley in 2009, and the company would fold. But the people involved in the creation of the Relics games would go on to their own successes in cult classics. Rei Nakazada would be heavily involved with Blue Dragon and Lost Odyssey, the latter of which would take some of the RPG fail-state ideas from Relics and develop them into a really good title. Other producers and staff went on to work for the Disgaea series. Relics has always been a kind of war between accessibility and alienation, and it really does raise questions about whether games should be enjoyable if they want to convey a certain mood. But the skeletal ideas in it would show up later in all sorts of places. The side-scrolling mystery dynamic and alien world greatly recall the games of Eric Chahi, like Another World and Flashback. The prog rock influences and unusual art design recall games like the Shadow of the Beast trilogy for Amiga. The limited control scheme and deliberate spoon-feeding of information recall modern mechanics from everything from Souls-likes to survival horror games. And the moral choice system would be the backbone of so many RPGs, and even show up in action-adventure hybrid games such as Bioforge. Even the possession mechanic and Heaven and Hell involvement would show up in other games as well later on, in Shiny Entertainment's Messiah in the late 1990s. But all of this happened before, and was ironed out in development between 1984 and 1986, years before any of those other games would even be conceived. And while Relic's gameplay would never quite match the ambition of its scope, it stands as an example of absolutely shooting for the moon. It is its own beast, uncompromising and playing by its own rules. And while technical limitations, a struggle between narrative and open-endedness, and external legal factors would mar the experience of the sequels, the games themselves still resonate. Sticking in the memory of their creators, and in the players themselves. See you next time. Thank you all for watching, and especially to the users on the Patreon, including Matt Leffler, Andro, and James B. Thank you especially to all of you who had patience with me while I was dealing with the move. Your patience is greatly appreciated. Thank you all again for watching, and I'll see you next time.